What's going on, podcast listeners? My name is Michael Chernow. I am a restaurateur and lifestyle entrepreneur, and I am truly obsessed with living a life better than yesterday through wellness, fitness, and good vibes. I've always wondered if the drive to succeed is something we are born with or if it's something that is made over time through grit, drive, and perseverance. I get to answer that question exactly, and the goal of this podcast is to talk with people that have absolutely crushed it in life and have inspired me to do the same. This is Born or Made. Ladies and gents, I am so fired up to introduce uh, guest number 17 on the Born or Made podcast. Uh, Emily Abadi is a very good friend. She has an insanely awesome podcast called The Hurdle Podcast. Uh, but not only that, she is also a freelance journalist. She writes for everyone from GQ to women's health to she writes about fitness and nutrition. And she is also a eight time marathon runner. Actually, Emily ran two marathons on two different continents within six days. So uh, I'm just honored to have you on the show. And uh, you inspire the daylights out of me. Emily Abadi, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I am what a what an honor that intro there, man. You know, you walk into the room and little rays of sunshine just fly all over the place. I mean, you've just been someone that from the day I met you, I was I was inspired. And uh, you know, you asked me to be on your podcast. I think it was the fourth episode on your podcast, um, and that's got to be like almost two years ago now, right? Over two years ago. I mean, it feels literally like a different lifetime. So much has happened since then. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself uh, before we sort of get into the whole spiel? For sure. I mean, you kind of hit the nail on the head there with all the great things you had to say. As you mentioned, I'm a freelance journalist. I have been uh, out on my own now, writing everywhere from self.com, women's health, men's health, well and good, GQ, Live Strong. I mean, basically any of these awesome media outlets that have health and wellness verticals, I'm pitching content there on the regular. Uh, and aside from that, as you mentioned, I am also a freelance journalist. I, I am also a podcaster. So Hurdle has been around since the very end of 2017. We're you know, about 1.2 million downloads in. We Boom. are over 170 episodes. I'm now at the point where we're publishing three times a week, which just is crazy. Uh, the podcast started bi-weekly with some awesome individuals, including yourself. And, you know, it's been a wild ride, but it's been a ride that I'm so, so grateful for and have learned so much on. Yeah, I mean, I, I got to say, I, I, I remember when we did that podcast, and um, it was actually probably one of the first podcasts I, re I was on. Um, you know, I, I, I've done a bunch since, but, um, you know, I just remember you are, you are an incredible host. You made me feel so comfortable when we were sitting in that little studio, uh, and, and we got deep, you know, like you, were, you, like you didn't have to do much to, to draw the, uh, to draw the, the, the juicy, the juiciness out of me. Um, so, uh, and, and honestly, I listen to your podcast pretty regularly. Um, I can't believe you had Rich Froning on. I'm like, Ah, oh, did you check that? He Dude. is. He's a great guy. I met him for the first time. I think it was about two years ago now. I had gone down uh, to his actual home in Cookville, Tennessee on assignment for men's health. And it was awesome to get to spend time with him and his family. And I went down so, so intimidated. I mean, if you just look at the guy, he is pure pure strength. And I went down certainly intimidated. And within the first hour of spending time with him, you can just tell that he is such a good hearted, kind guy. He's a family guy. And he just really puts pride in not only, you know, his work ethic, but of course, then his family and, and he really puts them first. So we uh, we were able to reconnect recently for an episode of the show. And it's crazy. I mean, the guy has uh, sneakers named after him. So I know. <laughs> I, I came so close to buying those sneakers right after I watched that Netflix documentary on him. I was like, all right, I got to maybe it's a bit. Maybe the sneakers will help me out. <laughs> 
Yeah, he is definitely someone that I would love to meet, um, and and it was a great episode. Um, so real quick, the Borner Made podcast. Uh, you know, we are here to talk about the nature nurture topic. Uh, I, I love to have people on the show uh, like you that have inspired me and many many others uh, to talk about this concept of whether people like you uh, were born with an inherent ability to sort of get after it, um, or if you we're made over time, right? Like, is it is it genetics or is it uh, situational? So why don't we go back to uh, to the beginning and let's hear it. Give it to us. <laughs> well, I was born in uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut at Bridgeport Hospital. I grew up in Trumbull, Connecticut. It's about hour, 20 minutes or so outside of New York City, where I sit right now on the Upper East Side. And my life from the get-go was good. Grew up with two very loving parents, one older brother, four years older than me to the day. We have the same birthday, which is always that's, a, that's crazy. A, a fun fact, an icebreaker fun fact. Uh, yeah, but grew up in a, in a beautiful home in Trumbull, Connecticut. And from an early age, I loved writing. And it's so funny because if you ask, you know, little girls, little boys, what they want to do when they get older. A lot of the time it's like, I want to be a fireman or a baseball player or an actress or like something really ritzy. And I'm like, I want to write. <laughs> and I felt that way from such such a young age, without a doubt. Can you remember a moment like, I mean, we're talking young, like like five, six, you were talking? For sure. I mean, I had journals from the age of six up through, I mean, I wake up every single day these days and the the first thing I do is spend 10 minutes writing in a journal. So I used to have like volumes, as I would call them, of journals just stacked in the closet. And, you know, of course, from the younger ages, they don't make much sense. But the, the work ethic was there for sure. Can you point to a moment where you said this is like, I like doing this? Or was it something that just literally was 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 an expression of your of your soul like what like I just I'm curious to know like what drew you to draw to writing for sure I remember in I believe it was fourth grade you know people kids they go out to recess and they play on the jungle gym and they play tag and you like have crushes on boys even though you don't really like boys yet and my small friend group, what we did is we would literally hang out together and write in our journals. And it was a privilege for someone to allow you the opportunity to read their journal. Or if you wrote something in your journal about somebody else, that was like, it was a big deal. And so I remember all the way back to fourth grade, like being at recess and we would all go out there with our journals and write in them. And I remember, you know, the boy that I had my first crush on that I wrote about in my journal and he had a journal too. And we <laughs> talked about going to the June fair together in our journals and Ah, oh, man, of course, like, why would I be a normal kid that wants to skip rope or, you know, play on the monkey bars, right? The journal days. So did the you have a di days. did you have a diary on top of a journal or was it was it a journal? I think it was just the journal. The journal was the in and out of home writing escape. Gotcha. All <laughs> right. So 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 you were you were writing from as early as you can remember and you can't really understand or you don't really have any sort of explanation as to why you took to it or fell in love with it. You just did. Yeah, I just did. And I mean, I started going to summer camp at a pretty young age. I believe I went to summer camp for an entire month at age six starting and proceeded to go to that same summer camp up through when I was a teenager and into my early 20s as a counselor and then a programming director. And so I would go to summer camp. And of course, such a big part of summer camp is writing letters, right? And hearing from your parents and communicating with your friends. And so from age six, I mean, fourth grade's not until age 11, I think. So from age six, I loved writing and communicating with the written word. And I remember to this day, and I tell her this all the time, my mom has the most beautiful penmanship. And so I think it was just, I always wanted to be as good of a writer, at least aesthetically, as her. This is an interesting question, I think. And I've actually asked a couple of different writer friends of mine this question because I, I do believe that there is, it distinguishes um, a different sort of category of writer. Do you, do you enjoy writing so that other people like do you enjoy writing uh, in, a, in a communicative way or do you enjoy writing in a sort of linear way? 
I mean, great question. I think that for me, I really communicate well through word. And I also think that sometimes when I'm not yet prepared to have important conversations or I do need to get something off of my chest, that I'll lean in to writing as a way to kind of digest the words before they technically, quote unquote, hit the universe. So for me, I mean, yeah. yeah. So for me, I would think that mostly it's communicating Uh, but I definitely, I write not just obviously for all the outlets, but also for myself and just kind of to process what's going on in my day-to-day life. I think it's a powerful tool. And before we just like go further, I just want to unpack that a little bit because I I do think that writing is an incredible way to, um, push pause on potentially something that's happening and you need to sort of like sift through it and, and, and cut the weeds out a little bit. Can you just walk us through like what that looks like for you? Yeah. And of course, I think that depending on the scenario, you approach writing in a different way. For instance, before I hopped on with you, I was working on an article for uh, Matt My Run's blog and the article was about how to know when you need to buy new sneakers. And so that writing process looks a whole lot different than the writing process that happens at 6.22 in the morning literally laying down in my bed. The The writing process that happened at my desk about an hour ago is me working uh, with experts and interviewing them and then taking those expert interviews and arranging them in a way so that the average consumer can digest easily the information that we are trying to present to them, which Mm -hmm. I think is a skill that you certainly kind of master over time in that I have met so many, so many experts in so many different fields, whether it's physicians or personal trainers or, God, I mean, dating experts, like experts everywhere. And they might be, you know, the top of the top, the best of the best. But when it comes to sometimes communicating their message or relaying their knowledge to other individuals, I mean, you can cook a mean meatball. I've done it with you. I've seen it. But it might be hard for you to like 100% nail on the head every time you want to help somebody else cook that same meat mall just as good. And that's because there's a fine art that comes in that communication and that relaying of information. And that's what I've had to learn over the years in my career as a journalist. When it comes to writing personally, I think it's the most therapeutic thing, just this opportunity to write without boundaries, right? To dive into whatever's going on in your head. And some days in the mornings, these journal entries are organized and I'm writing on a certain topic or perhaps a certain thought prompt that I find really intriguing. But other days, the writing in the morning could be one sentence about what happened yesterday morning at 9.32 a.m. and then one sentence about how there's a book that I want to read. And none of it really seems to align well together, but it's all stuff that just feels good to get out onto the paper. And I think That's what's so great about journaling is just there are no rules. And a lot of the time when people say, oh, I wish that I did that. I wish that I journaled. I mean, at the end of the day, you're the only thing that's standing in your way from getting any action or doing anything, executing on anything. So you just need to stop probably being so hard on yourself about what the format of that should look like or you perceive it should look like. So you definitely use journaling as a as a consistent tool for ways to just take that extra step to potentially get something off your mind, potentially remind you of something to do. Um, it's it's literally a, a tool in your toolbox that you use and have been using for a long time. Without a doubt. And again, it can look different every single day. Um, and I also do something that uh, it's one of the favorite, it's one of my favorite things that I do is I write letters to people. And it doesn't necessarily need to be uh, someone that I'm even actively engaging with in my life at this current time, but it could be just someone that's kind of at the top of my mind. Again, me processing either an interaction or thinking of something that I want to say to them, but don't know if either I'm ready to say or feel as though maybe writing it out first could help me in delivering this message later on. And so I used to write these letters in a notebook that I would take with me when I travel. And I would always write the letter on the way home from my trip. 
uh, whether it was for someone I was seeing at the time in a relationship, whether it was a friend of mine, whether it was to my parents, just needing to air different things out. And I realized on, God, week eight of being in my apartment that I kind of missed speaking to these people that don't know that I'm speaking to them in this really special way. To date, I've only shared one of these letters. Like I read the letter to this person. I felt like it was a progressive and good idea. <laughs> wow. But yeah, it's uh it's, you know, every different every different way of writing, every every different way of communication for me, they all have some sort of perk. I just think it's so interesting that that human beings um, sort of gravitate towards different expression opportunities or different expression tools. You know, um, I, I just think it's, you know, like because you could talk to somebody else who's, uh, you know, incredibly successful in their life, whether it's, you know, through their, their career or through just through their family or through happiness um, that would say I never write, you know. And so like it's just it's I, I just find it to be so interesting that that you know, certain people take to different things in different ways and, and they find them to be super duper successful. Um, all right. So you are a you, you love writing and you're in fourth grade. Uh, where are we going now? <laughs> we are off to middle school and then middle school becomes high school. And I think probably an important part to my story is that growing up, you know, I grew up again, this loving uh, Italian Jewish family. I mean, for me, uh, food and family were very intertwined. And part of loving one another was cooking together and enjoying that experience together, something I'm sure that you can relate to as well. And so growing up for me, I was always kind of working on my relationship with food. And because of that, uh, I did a lot of I guess weight cycling or yo-yo dieting, so to speak. It would be like stopping into Weight Watchers meetings with my mom from a young age. And by young, I mean I think the first time I probably went to a meeting like that was maybe at age 15 or so when it just was – me going to regular doctor's appointments or my annual checkup and the doctor being like, hmm, maybe you should watch your diet a little bit. Or they look at those BMI charts and they have this impression that this one number is determining of entirely how healthy you are. Um, and so from a young age, I, I think I really was working to understand how to have like a healthy relationship with food. Um, and that is I say uh, is poignant because for me, when I got to high school, um, I really struggled with my weight. And it's interesting now when I look back on that time is that I actually try to reflect on it. And I've blacked a lot of it out because when I think of that time and I think about how I felt about myself and my body, I mean, I was an overweight girl in high school. I felt like everyone was getting their first boyfriends and I wasn't doing that. I uh, tried to make the JV volleyball team my sophomore year and didn't make the team because I couldn't run a mile in under 10 minutes. Um, and so I really struggled with my weight in high school. But again, the one thing that I felt to be consistent was my love for writing. And so with time, as high school went on, I without a doubt knew that I wanted to go to college uh, to investigate that a little bit. Uh, and so I applied to a, a slew of different universities, but I ended up at the University of Connecticut, where I studied, uh, went on to study journalism and political science. That's amazing, and and you just sort of like brushed by this this pretty sizable chunk of your life that I I know about that was that was very difficult for you, um, and uh, and and it's a big part of your story. So I just want to sort of backpedal a little bit um, because I think uh, understanding you know what you do in your profession right now. Um, has a lot to do with probably, uh, you know, some of that, um, some of that stuff that, that happened in, in high school that, you know, cause I, I, I also can identify with the idea of, uh, blocking out things and moments in life, whether they're, you know, six months or six years or 10 years, um, that were really difficult. And, um, and, you know, I've done a lot of work and I'm sure you have too on really trying to understand what that, um, what that was like, uh, and, uh, and, and how to, 
potentially use that adversity, which is what your podcast is about for the most part, understanding adversity and understanding how to sort of uh, analyze it a little bit, not totally over intellectualize it, but analyze it a little bit and then say, hey, like I've come out of this thing and here's what I'm doing now. And probably a lot of it has to pay, you know, pay some sort of uh, attribute to, to, to what you went through. So what was that like when you were in yeah, high school? So so when I was in high school, I mean, it was really difficult to feel like there were things that I was good at, but because of what I looked like, I didn't feel like anyone maybe even seemed to care. And I know that that was, you know, something that I internalized and how I felt at the time, but it definitely was something that weighed really heavily um, on my heart. And again, I mean, not remembering so much about that time on my, my memory and recollection of that time period for me. I look back, I mean, I was heavily involved uh, after the whole volleyball thing didn't work out. I became heavily involved in a regional uh, and international, ultimately, youth group called B'nai Breath. And uh, my chapter of B'nai Breath, I became the president of that uh, in the local Bridgeport area. And then I went on to be president of the region of the youth group. And I think, you know, 50 states, something like 50 some odd regions in the country. I was one of, you know, a very select um, group of, of teens that had the privilege to literally stand at the front of a governing body of young women and, and lead. And it's crazy because that sounds today like exactly something that the Emily of today would do. But when I reflect on that time, again, there are so little that I remember of actually executing and the memories that I have at that time and so selective just because despite I remember and and remember the recognition doing great at that opportunity and having a really wonderful experience in that time I just don't remember much about it and so basically what happens is when I get to college, as everybody does, I, I do gain a little bit more weight, but it's nothing astronomical. I get to my spring semester of my freshman year in college, and I finally am studying for a final exam. And I say to myself, you know what would be a good idea right now? I should just like step on a scale because that's like everything that you want to do when it's 7.30 p.m. at night and you're procrastinating writing a term paper and you're like, I should definitely get on a scale right now. And so I pull out this scale that's been under the bed, the bunk bed in my dorm room since I moved in and I tap it and I get on it and I wait for that screen to populate and waiting for that number to show up to tell me what I already knew. It probably took three seconds, but felt like an eternity. And so up on the scale, I see it right below me. It says 204 pounds. And it's not that I didn't know. It's just that I don't think I was ready until maybe that moment just to confront it. And so I see the 204 pounds on the scale and I immediately do something at the time which is so counterintuitive to all of my being, which is throw on a old high school volleyball sweatshirt and some cotton leggings from Target and some old sneakers and run down the sneak run down the stairs from my dorm out into the the open road and I sprint as far as I can which probably lasts like let's be optimistic maybe 15 seconds until I fall into the grass and I remember so clearly the glass the grass was dewy and wet and it was late at night and the stars were out and I'm in like cow country in stores Connecticut at the University of Connecticut looking up at the sky and I just knew in that moment that I needed to pivot that I needed to make a change because I wanted to be happy like I wanted so much more for myself and I knew that there was more for me to go after it wasn't just the number on the scale and I want to read reiterate that is that there can be different levels of health at every size. But for me, at 204 pounds, I wasn't happy. I was extremely lonely. I look back at photos of that time and they're all like selfies of my face because I'm ashamed and scared to show off my body to anyone. And so at that moment, what I affectionately on the on my podcast call my hurdle moment, that's when I knew that, you know, my life was going to change and it would change for the better. It just might not be, you know, the easiest experience for me to undertake. Wow. That's, that's an incredible story. I, I, when you were explaining like 
taking the sprint, I saw it like like in an actual movie, like taking the sprint, getting down in the grass, the explanation of the grass, looking up at the stars. I mean, you know, I have a moment. I have a moment like that too, um, and I and I clearly remember. Um, the moment when I had to change my life because uh, I was I was addicted to you know all sorts of different things and it sounds like you had an addiction as well and I think I interestingly enough I think like addiction is is um, when you block it out I, I feel like typically when people block things out they are actually um, it's something that they that they struggle with, but it's something that they want, and so it's very very difficult to define because it's two contradictory things, right? Like you really really struggle, but you also really really want it. And I remember that so clearly about my issue with alcohol and drugs was that like I just wanted it so bad, but I hated it so much, and um, and that's when that's when I broke. And it sounds like that's when you changed your life. Um, but one thing that I wanted to say was, you know, you you were you were the president of what was the the name of the the youth the youth group? The local uh, region of my youth group was called the Connecticut Valley region of the Bene Breath Youth Organization. So B- Bene Breath or BBYO is an international youth group with chapters literally everywhere from Israel and Europe to here in the United States. And I was um, the president, or in Hebrew, you call that Nasia of the local region, which comprised parts of Connecticut and Massachusetts and Long Island. Why weren't you okay with just being part of the group? Why did you feel like you, you know? I think for me, it was an opportunity. And that can be what I, what I would say is the difference between a lot of people is letting things that scare them be either a hurdle or a roadblock or letting something that scares you be an opportunity to try something new, to get outside of your comfort zone with the understanding that eventually you'll have the opportunity to grow. Do I think at that time, at that age, that I viewed going after this coveted spot, running, so to speak, in the election to to nail this position, did I see that as like, wow, this is really going to turn me into who I want to be? Of course not. I was, you know, a 17-year-old girl that was dealing with body positivity issues and trying to figure out who I was. But at the end of the day, like, I wanted to do that because I think – At the time, even, maybe I was a little bit tired of being told that I wasn't good enough to do other things. And it was this thing that I saw that was within my reach and I had the skill set and I was passionate about, you know, all of the different pillars of which the youth group was founded on. And I looked at that opportunity and I said to myself, like, that's something for me. Like, that is something that not only can I be good at, but I can execute on and then help other people in the process, which again, today when I talk about it and I reflect on that experience, these are all things that I am so passionate about in my day-to-day work and especially with Hurdle today. But back then, I mean, it was just, it was definitely going into the opportunity, not really understanding the magnitude of that's exactly what it was, a big opportunity for me. So you're in the grass and you're looking up at the stars and you you make a decision. Uh, and that decision was what? I needed to make a change. And so I didn't at that time decide I am, and this is a, a little spoiler alert, I'm going to lose 70 pounds. That's not the decision that I made in the grass. The decision that I made in the grass was that I needed to make a change, period. And so this change for me happened in two phases. The first phase for me was learning how to eat better uh, and learning how to eat better looked a lot like learning to exercise portion control. I was, after all, a rising college sophomore. I did not want to sacrifice, you know, the going out, the being with my friends. My brother at the time when I had this realization was doing his quote unquote victory lap at UConn. So I had a cool older brother that was there to like host us at all of these off-campus gatherings and it was a great time man but I didn't want to sacrifice a lot of that but I did know that I needed to make sacrifices uh, in other aspects of my life so again with the portion control this meant that I wasn't eating you know Yukon dairy bar banana chocolate chip ice cream every single day with lunch and dinner this meant that I wasn't having 
like hash browns for breakfast, tater tots for lunch, and french fries for dinner. It just meant that I needed to start exercising a little bit of self-control when it came to the decisions that I was making with food. And that certainly paid off, you know, with time. Uh, For me, that first phase uh, was about a year and a half of just the learning how to get my eating kind of under control. And uh, after a year and a half, I was back at that summer camp again, working as uh, the programming director there that summer. And that's the summer that I learned to run. Uh, I won't even say that I necessarily learned to love running that summer, but I learned to run. And I reflect again on that high school volleyball experience, the one where I didn't make the team my JV year because I couldn't run a mile in under 10 minutes. And so ever since that experience, I had a questionable relationship with the idea of running up until this point at the summer camp. And so I arrived there having already lost about 35 pounds, knowing that I still was not willing to go back to where I started. Wait a sec. So you lost 35 pounds when you made the decision to just take that that step in, in portion control. Yeah, so I think it was the portion control, learning how to eat better, exercising more self-control. And then at the time, I was working out a little bit. So it looked like going to the on-campus gym and getting on the elliptical or maybe walking more between my classes instead of grabbing rides with friends. It was just integrating more regular movement into my routine, but still no at no point during this phase of the weight loss I call phase one was I a highly active person. I was just like going to the gym and watching some sort of reality TV for 45 minutes while I was on an incline of 10 walking on the treadmill or hitting the elliptical. And so- Okay, do you remember having some sort of a mechanism to stop yourself to just say, you know what, this is not, I don't need to do this. Because I think that is where people struggle. I think the best thing that you can do is if there's ever a point where you're about to walk over to the fridge or over to the cabinet or wherever you're heading to get that thing that you know that you don't technically really want, but you think that you want in that moment for just a second, or actually I'll rephrase that for about five minutes, think about it. So say you walk into the kitchen, you get there. You know what you're about to do. Leave the kitchen. Leave the kitchen for five, 10 minutes and ask yourself during that time, how would I feel right now, 10 minutes later, if I had went after the thing that I was about to go after? And if the answer in your gut is, oh, no, that would have been bad, then okay, that's a clear sign that you still don't need it. But if the answer in your, if the answer in your gut is, yeah, you know what, I still really want this thing. I think I'm going to have the thing. Then you have the thing. You go for it. But I bet you nine times out of 10, the first situation is going to happen, not the second one. And again, I have always, you are, you sir, are are much more diligent with what you put in your body than I am. Um, But what I will say is that I have, I've just never been like, super strict, counted my macros, none of that. That's never been my thing. What's been my thing is like having honest, open conversations with myself and really getting to a place where I can listen to my body and listen to what's really happened and asking myself truthfully, are you hungry or are you going into the kitchen for the 14th time today because something is up and you need to talk to yourself about that? Hmm. Because usually it's probably that. That's really what's going on. I think we are in a state currently right now, and we haven't even talked about the state that we're in right now, hence the Zoom uh, podcast. Um, but I think mental health is, is a real thing. Uh, well, actually I don't think, I know it's a real, it's a real thing and it's, and it's a bit of an epidemic right now. And specifically because we're all at home and taken out of our routine and taking out of our rhythms. Um, but that self-awareness and the ability to stop and have that conversation with yourself is something that I practice regularly. I think it's so important. I think that that is the distinguishing element between the doers and the the talkers. Um, Being able to just, you know, like make a decision and be cool if you blow it every once in a while, but 
80% of the time you practice that little moment in time, that little thing that you just say, you know, do I, it's six o'clock in the morning. I made a decision that I was going to work out five days a week early before I have to sacrifice my time with my family or my time at work. You just do it. It's just like that little moment where you have that little conversation. I think that it could be 30 seconds. It could be five seconds. It could be 10 seconds. It could be two minutes or five minutes or 10 minutes, like you've said. But I think that that is really, we are our biggest hurdles, right? Like we are the biggest roadblock. And um, I think understanding those moments where, like, again, like it's, it's, it's tools where you can open up your toolbox and just pull out this thing that you know actually works. Like it actually works. It's not like a, hey, I wake up, I breathe for, you know, seven, seven minutes. And I, it's really like in the moment right there where you can actually apply something to actually de- derail a poor decision that you might potentially make. Totally. And I mean, I'll, I'll be completely transparent is that, and I'll be completely transparent, I really struggled with some of the issues that I dealt with. God, this, I mean, I graduated from college in 2010, so I was going through a big chunk of my weight loss, 2008, 2009. I struggled with some of these same questions that I used to ask myself back during this t- back during that time recently with the rise of the pandemic and and being alone in my home day in and day out for the first time in forever. I mean, when I was in my teenage years, again, that was the last time that I was spending so much time alone in the house that I grew up in. I'd come home after school and I'd be there for just a couple of hours before both of my parents got home. And I, at that time, felt like I didn't have control, that I would mindlessly go to the fridge and snack and make a bag of frozen french fries for no other reason, just because aside from the fact that I was either bored or looking to distract myself from maybe handling some of the emotions that I was dealing with inside. And so recently, I mean, about, I would say six weeks ago now, I noticed that I was really struggling with some of those same issues. And I counted one day by ticking it off on a post-it note that I had walked into my kitchen 14 times, 14 throughout the day. I mean, I have a 550 square foot apartment (laughs) on the Upper East Side. Like there's not that far to go. But still, I had kind of one of these hurdle moments, so to speak, where I was like, M, like, Let's get back to this. Obviously, you feel out of control, and that is why you're walking into the kitchen. You don't know what's going on. We don't have an end in sight. You're looking to to find some sort of quote-unquote balance, but what's really happening by you walking into the kitchen 14 times during the day is you're not achieving balance at all. You're actually getting to a point where it's disruptive, it is making you unhappy, and the things that you are putting into your body are no longer nourishment. It's just a distraction again. So I had this hurdle moment. And I mean, since having that conversation with myself, I can without a doubt say that I'm in such a better place now. And and that involved, again, going back to the things that I lean into whenever I'm struggling with anything, the journaling, the honest conversation, the being upfront with myself, and really recognizing a pattern and being okay to get vulnerable with myself. Because again, if you don't if you aren't willing to admit what's going on in any situation, then nothing can change. So the first step is admitting and coming clean with what's going on in the scenario. And then the next step is then you have the opportunity to start taking action. Are you as um, healthy with your communication with yourself, with others? Yeah. Um, I especially, again, I mean, let's talk about this time and and how we have been handling our relationships. For me, it is so important just to be upfront and honest uh, with the people 
that I care about specifically. I mean, from my family to my friends. And I try to, uh, at the for the most part, you know, do business with people that I find can we can have a really open and honest dialogue as well. Um, I'm super honored, you know, with everyone from who I have on the show to the sponsors that come on the show. It's These are brands and individuals that I really believe have similar values and um, really like are passionate, like community driven people who really value relationships. And so for me, communication is just so important because I every day wake up and I live my life by my family motto, which is do good. My grandfather always used to tell it to us constantly when he was alive. And I want to do good every single day. And part of that for me is communicating openly and honestly with the people that I care about and the people that I work with. And so, I mean, at least to say I I try. I try. When you are able to just, you know, sort of like break out of that fear of hurting someone's feelings, fear of uh, saying something wrong, um, communication with ourselves, honest communication with ourselves uh, and and with others. I I just I don't know of any other way to really sort of like get through situations and be real and transparent. Um, All right. So I want to get through the rest of your story. (laughs) <laughs> I want. I also just want to say one thing. So you lost seventy pounds. That that in itself, right? Forgetting about your your accolades in writing and your podcast and and all the other things that you've done, that in itself could very well be one of the most difficult things for anyone to do. The amount of commitment, dedication, um, and and just like focus that one needs to 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 do that is really intense. Um, and so I just, I appreciate you, you opening up about that. Cause I think, I think it's probably one of your greatest accomplishments, honestly. Yeah. And I think the thing about weight loss is of course, the actual act of weight loss is extremely taxing both emotionally and physically, but keeping off weight loss, uh, when you're in a healthy place at the end of it and you want to keep living this life and, and not go back to where you came from, that I believe is the true testament to if you have gone about it in a way that is positive and healthy. So I'll lead you into into how I, I feel about that today. I mean, what I was saying about working at the summer camp was that was the summer that I learned to enjoy and then ultimately love running. And back to you know, that that JV volleyball mishap where I didn't make the team, I knew that that summer, if I wanted to keep losing weight, I was down about 35 pounds at the time. I didn't have a big box gym like a Planet Fitness to go to to just stand mindlessly on an elliptical for 45 minutes. So if I wanted to keep losing weight, I knew that I was going to have to get active in some other way. And so for me, I knew it. That meant that I was going to have to start running. And so I remember that entire summer as clear as day, it would be like, go to lunch, leave lunch. We had uh, an hour after lunch called rest hour. And during that hour, that was when I would change into my Hanes cotton V-neck and a pair of old Target leggings. And I would go out the door and run down the street and run back up the street and then shower. And then I think period four or five was the next thing after rest hour and I would like walk my way over to the pool and every day that was the routine and just like what you were saying before about you make a decision and you commit like I was committed to that 14 minute run every single day and so come the end of the summer I'd probably lost like another I mean in two months time maybe 15 20 pounds and I remember putting on this pair of Gap jeans that I had purchased at the Gap outlet like 10 minutes from the summer camp. Can I just point size. one other thing out? Yeah. You said you remember the brands of your <laughs> of your V-neck t- t-shirt, your Target leggings, your Gap jeans. That's a writer. There's no doubt about <laughs> it. Like the descriptions, awesome. I love it. And so I, I had bought these Gap jeans that were like two or three sizes too small at the beginning of the summer. And I remember wearing them to dinner on the final night. And the next day, I measured the distance that I was running every day in my blue Jetta. And I went to measure it because I was just curious. Like, I was pretty positive it was a mile. So I go out, I drive back, 
and it's a half mile. It took me 14 minutes. I don't even know how. I think I could crawl a half mile today in 14 minutes, but it took me 14 minutes a day to run a half mile. And again, another like beyond your years wisdom moment. I could have been so mad at that scenario like I could have been so frustrated like what do you mean it took me 14 minutes I ran a half mile like what is this but ultimately the distance isn't what mattered because by the end of that summer by the day I got in my Jetta to measure that distance I have learned to like something that I thought that I could never do well and my definition of well at that time wasn't okay I can run a mile my definition of well was I can do this, period. That's it. I can do it and I can like it. And so from that point forward, that summer of running that half mile, it just was the building block. It was the foundation, right? Because eventually that half mile would become a 5K race. And then that 5K race would become the first time that I decided to sign up for a half marathon and I was scared shitless to do it. (laughs) And then I would run that half marathon in almost like – I ran my first half marathon years later. Um, I believe it was in maybe 2009. And I ran my first half marathon in two hours and 52 minutes. And my fastest marathon to date is three hours and 28 minutes. So if you think about that and how much can change, and again, we're talking about a big span of time here, but I would never have gotten to the place where I could run a 328 marathon if I never ran the 14 minute half mile every single day for seven and a half weeks. I absolutely love that you said that. I think that that is that is that is so important Um, because that's what it takes. It does not start at the top. But I do want to point something out. You joined that youth group and you became the president. You decided that you wanted to sort of pivot your life and lose some weight and you lost an enormous amount of weight. You sort of kind of dipped into this running thing and had some sort of inkling of of excitement and enjoyment around it. And now you are an eight time marathon runner. So like (laughs) there's something there's there there's something there that you have that I, I, I would argue to say you probably don't know how to explain that you can't just do something well, you have to do something as good as anybody could ever imagine right like you have to and I'm the same way and I think a lot of people uh that I have on this show are actually right like you cannot just make a decision to do something and be cool like it's just never it's a non it's a it's a never anything like I remember when I had you had me on your podcast and you were like I'm gonna do this podcast and now the New York Times is talking about your podcast (laughs) You know yeah. what I mean? And and you're at 110 episodes or something like that. And you've had unbelievable guests. Um, you're a special person. And I think you've gone through, um, you know, you have a, a really great story. And, um, and, and it, it's inspiring to hear. And I think you most likely will have helped a bunch of people who have listened to this. Um, because, I mean your writing stuff is obviously something that is, is, is also important. I mean, you got me, you, you made one of my dreams come true. You called me up one day and you said, Hey, how would you feel about being in men's health? And I was like, dream, like, that's, a, <laughs> that's a dream. And you made it happen. And, and, you know, and it was an amazing thing. And that's, you know, like you are, you are, um, you're a leader and you're strong and, um, you know, if there's a if there's a piece of advice that you'd like to that maybe was given to you uh, that you've passed on or a piece of advice that you've sort of um, incubated yourself that you um, have given to others, you know, and it doesn't have to be pertaining to any one particular thing. But just um, it, what, 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 what kind of advice would you like to give? I think I always go back to this idea is that all it takes is all you've got, right? So if you make a decision and you commit to something, then you owe it to yourself to go for it. I was having a conversation earlier today with a friend who asked me if I thought that he should give a 20-minute speech or a 20-minute talk to a group of people about a certain topic. And 
I said, I actually think that you would be great for that. I would learn a lot from you if you did that. And then by doing that experience, you could probably outline some sort of e-course that you could then sell and replicate and, you know, make money off of. And he said, well, I don't really want to make the e-course. And that's what separates me Mm -hmm. and probably you and Mm -hmm. many of the people listening to this from, uh, you know, the other is that for me, I am just a balls in. Once I commit, I commit. Let's do it. I'm game. How can I show up for you? I want to be your cheerleader. Let me be your hype man. I'm there. Like, let's do it. But not everyone feels that way. And that's cool. There are going to be different people in this world. And I respect you and your process, just like I hope that people respect me and my process. But I think this all it takes is all it all it takes is all you've got mentality is what enables me to wake up every single day and be passionate about what it is that I do. I would not be able to just be skirting by. Like skirting by and status quo is not my MO. My MO is to show up wholeheartedly and just give it all I've got. And so I encourage everyone, whether they're a hurdler, as I like to call my audience, or anyone else, just to find the things in your life that you are passionate about, the things that make you giddy and they make you smile and they make you excited to live your life and do as much of that as you possibly can. And if you're lucky enough, you'll be able not just to live your life enjoying it, but then to make them your life's work, to bring your passions into your life's work and give your life's work all that you have. Boom. All it takes is all you've got. I might have to get that tattooed on my chest. You are welcome. That that is so good. I love Emily it. Abadi, that is so good. All it takes is all you got, and I don't think I don't think that it, there there's anything that could be any more true. You know, I think my gosh, you know, it's it's um, if you're not leaving it out there, uh, you weren't there, and uh, and I and I and I I know that's true for me. I, I mean, I think we're both a little extreme, but um, <laughs> man, I can't thank you enough for joining me uh, today, and. Um, I've got to ask you the question. Do you think you are born or made? I know you think I'm born. (laughs) I truly feel like I'm made, though. I feel like I'm made because I think that I am a very analytical and a very reflective person, and I learn a lot. I literally squeeze every lesson I can out of everything that I do. And so I think about the things that have happened. And I do think for sure that, you know, I had great role models growing up. I watched my dad build his marketing business, his advertising business from absolutely nothing. He's an entrepreneur. I definitely think I get this entrepreneurial side from from him. And I and I, you know, I I thank my family again for their love and support to help can help enable me and make me believe in myself that I could go after all of these different things. But I really do reflect on what's happened in my 32 years of life next week. And I think that I, it's like 50, 50. Like I think that I was born with a desire to be great, but I have learned how to go after what I want um, because of, you know, these things that I have endured along the way. So I don't know. I think it's a little bit of both. I can't say one or the other, but I I recognize both sides. (laughs) There's no wrong answer or right answer. Um, I'm so happy when people say made because I think that, uh, you know, it, it gives people out there that are like aspiring to be an entrepreneur or aspiring to be great at something. Um, this 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 uh, this opportunity to believe that it's possible. Um, I will say really quick is that I think that really the made component of my story is just this constant quest to learn from people that I respect. And so like when I wanted to start the pod, I didn't know the first thing about starting a podcast, but I just sought out people that had done it before me that I could ask about it. Or but can I just say I something? Wanted, that's, yeah. wh- that's why you were born. Yeah. Because not everybody does that. <laughs> not everybody does that. Not everybody says, oh, you know, I want to do a podcast. I'm going to learn every single thing I need to learn about podcasting. Some people <laughs> say, oh, I want to do a podcast. And then like, 
you know, buy a microphone and then never do anything with it. So That's I'm true. just, I, that, you know, like I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't want to discourage your answer because I, I'm, I'm so happy that you said that. And by the way, like I said earlier, it is 50, 50, it is totally 50, 50. And I would say it's actually less than 50, 50. I'd say, uh, fewer people have said born, uh, the majority of the people have said both because it probably is both. Right. Uh, and, 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 more, you know, more people have said made than born, but I'd say the most people have said both. So anyway, you are the bomb. I am so grateful for you. I'm grateful for our friendship. I'm grateful to know you. I'm super grateful that you got me in the pages of men's health magazine. And, um, <laughs> you know, and look, I, I, I think, uh, all it takes is all you got. If that's all we got from this, I'm so <laughs> pumped. We did pretty good. We did good. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Hopefully, we'll get through this crazy time soon. Um, you're the best. You're the best. Where can you're we find best. you real quick? Of Where course. Can you can find me over on the socials at Emily Abate, A-B-B-A-T-E, and also, of course, at Hurdle Podcast. And also, make sure to check out Hurdle in the iTunes store or wherever you get your podcasts on the regular. Sweetness. All right, Emily. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, bud. Appreciate you.